Welcome to New City Church Online for today's broadcast. My name is Eric. I'm the lead pastor of New City Church, and I'm glad that you're joining us, whether you are a regular attender still uh, doing church at home or you're uh, visiting us for the first time on our online platform. We're so glad that you're here with us today. We pray that today's message is encouraging to you. It's challenging to you, and most of all, that, that you hear from God in a clear way. Now, I want to jump in to our series that we're starting today, a brand new series. Uh, once, a while, once in a while, in the ebbs and flows of our message series calendar as a church, we're going to hit the pause button. And what we do is we kind of pick a book of the Bible and we just camp out in that book of the Bible and we go verse by verse through that book. And for the rest of the summer, we're doing that with the Old Testament book, the minor prophet named Habakkuk. And what we want you to understand about Habakkuk is it's a book that kind of triggers around this main idea of when God just doesn't make sense, when God doesn't make sense. So why would we go through a book of the Bible verse by verse? Why would we take time to do that? And why, more specifically, would we go through a book like Habakkuk? It's such a small book. It's only three chapters. We're not really sure. Uh, maybe you're not really sure what prophecy of the Old Testament has to do with us today. Well, here's why. We believe that all of the Bible, that all of the Bible is actually God speaking to us. And in the Bible, we learn about the nature and the character of God all throughout Scripture. We want to teach all of Scripture because the Bible would say about itself that all Scripture is useful. So yes, a minor prophet named Habakkuk, who is kind of just making sense of everything going on around him, that's applicable for us today. And second, why I want us to take some time to go through the book of Habakkuk is this, is that there is so much honesty tucked away in the words and pages of this minor prophet of the Old Testament. Listen, I want you to understand this. We have all been where Habakkuk has been. We've all said some of the same things that Habakkuk has said, and we can learn about his conversation that you'll see that he has with God. There's a lot for us to take away. So I want to give you some background about this book because context is very important. We can read something in Scripture and not really know who it was written to or why, and that can get us in a lot of trouble. This minor prophet, the prophet Habakkuk, was set against the background of the unfortunate decline and eventual fall of the kingdom of Judah. Now let me set up why there's a kingdom called Judah, because after one of the greatest kings in all of Israel's history, King Solomon, after he died, Israel would actually begin to disintegrate from the inside. It wouldn't be from an outside force, it would be from the inside. In Solomon's family and in his descendants, there would be a lot of debating, a lot of infighting, and it doesn't take long for the nation of Israel to actually split into two separate countries. You have the kingdom of Israel, and you have the kingdom of Judah. Now, Judah would take more of the traditional tribes with it. It became one of the bigger kingdoms, and Israel was a smaller kingdom. Israel would actually be quickly captured and defeated by Babylon, and Judah is kind of left there all alone. It's not an influential kingdom in the ancient world by any means, but it's there, and under the leadership of some very evil leaders who turned away from God, they would fall deeper and deeper away from God and away from what David and Solomon had established, and they'd fall into idolatry. They would begin to worship and pay more attention to other things other than God, which is never a good choice. All of this would happen under a king named King Ammon. Now, he would die eventually, and there was no heir left to the throne except for his eight-year-old son, named Josiah. This eight-year-old would take the throne of Judah. Now, as time would go on, Josiah would reign for quite a number of years, but as he got older, he would begin to devote his heart and his mind back to God. And he would begin as the king to lead all of these reforms among God's people in order for them to repent from all the mistakes that they made by following all those idols and turning back to God. It was a great moment in history. Now, he would have some help beside him from another prophet named Jeremiah, who would begin to help call people back to God. So Josiah, as the king, would fix the temple, bring it back to its glory. He would call the people to follow the covenants of the Old Testament, the festivals and the feasts, and follow the law once again. And things would be going well in Judah. People were turning back to God. Now, after some... Uh, wars that were going on around Judah, something would happen inside Judah. 
the, Josiah would find himself as king actually fighting against the Egyptians. And to make a long story short, Josiah didn't want to be the kind of king that would send people away to fight for him. He wanted to fight alongside of them. But unfortunately, as he's fighting alongside his men, he dies. This great reformer, this great leader dies in battle. And the people would quickly put one of his sons, Jehoiakim, on the throne. And let's just say he wasn't a good king. He pretty much undid all the reforms that his father put in place. And for the next 11 years, he would lead Judah straight into their destruction. See, with Jehoiakim on the throne, all of the great reforms that Josiah had made, all of the God-honoring, God-exalting reforms, all that progress was completely blown to pieces. And so now you have Habakkuk, and he enters the scene. Now, Habakkuk is unique to Old Testament prophets because Old Testament prophets were a mouthpiece for God. God would give them a message and he would give it to the people. But Habakkuk is unique. He doesn't receive a message from God to give to the people, but rather the book of Habakkuk is Habakkuk speaking to God about the people and what was happening around him. Now, you'll see as we unpack this week by week, Habakkuk is going to ask some of the most penetrating and honest questions in all of Scripture. And when God does answer those questions, you and I get a proper view of who God is and how he relates to us, even in the middle of our pain and our confusion. How God relates to us when God just doesn't make sense. So I want to open it up with just the first four verses today. That's all we're going to spend time on. I'm going to read two different translations. I'm going to read the New International Version of the Bible, but I'm also going to read from the Message Version, which I think helps us to see how straightforward Habakkuk really is when he looks around him and sees that the people have turned away from God. And this is what he says to God. So Habakkuk chapter 1, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. There's no nice opening prayer nice uh, introduction about who Habakkuk is. He gets right to the point. But I want you to see uh, in, in a more understandable way what the message version of the Bible says. It says this, the problem as God gave Habakkuk to see it. This is what Habakkuk says, God, how long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell help, murder, police before you come to the rescue? Why do you force me to look at evil, evil and stare trouble in the face day after day? Anarchy and violence break out. Quarrels and fights all over the place. Law and order fall to pieces. Justice is a joke. The wicked have the righteous hamstrung and they stand justice on its head. Why in the world does it seem like Habakkuk is so upset? Listen, let, let's, let's put our hearts and minds right there with Habakkuk. Imagine you're Habakkuk. And you have seen idolatry. You, you've seen that reign. You, you've seen, uh, you know, as a man of God, you, you see that, and then you beg God to do something about it. And then only to begin, you, you watch God actually answer those prayers, and you see these great kings come to power and lead all these reforms. People actually turn their hearts back to God, and there's a faint idea that revival might be coming. Only very quickly to watch it unravel right before your eyes, and then it goes back to worse than it was before. Do you know what Habakkuk does? Habakkuk refuses to stay silent. Habakkuk was a man in the midst of all of this who sought answers. He was troubled by what he observed, and he goes right to God, and he asks some very difficult questions. Here's the reality. Here's the connection to us. Why would we talk about Habakkuk? Because Habakkuk actually gives voice to our bewilderment. He articulates your puzzled attempt to make sense of what's going on and my puzzled attempt to make sense of what's going on around us. 
He does that. He goes to God directly with our disappointment and catch this in what God does or what God doesn't do. He insists, very matter of fact, that God pay attention to us as we ask difficult questions and we refuse to stay silent. And, and here's the kicker. Habakkuk is not actually mad about the Assyrians or the Egyptians and what they've done to Judah. He's more mad at God's people. He's madder that God seems to be doing nothing about it. Here's why Habakkuk is such an important book for you and for me. Because on the road to our Christian maturity, something we should all want, we will almost all hit spots like this. Something will inevitably happen to us, and we will ask similar questions. We will say, God, what in the world are you doing? If you are so loving and you're so gracious, then how can this be happening to me? See, this argument isn't just found in the church and among Christians. We hear it all the time around us, don't we? I mean, the phrase out there that for people who have a really hard time believing in God, they say things like this, if there's some loving, all-knowing, and all-powerful God, then explain to me all the atrocities against mankind. Why does God let those things happen? Why do those things happen? See, Habakkuk, just like us, he's honest in this moment. He doesn't play games. He's confused, he's frustrated, and he brings all that before God. What a crazy idea. I mean, if you grew up in church, aren't you just supposed to hide all those emotions and stay quiet and just keep singing like nothing's wrong? Not Habakkuk. And it shouldn't be for us. Now, we could spend time today breaking down verse by verse what Habakkuk said in those first four verses, but I, I think it's pretty straightforward. He's mad, and he's asking God, what in the world are you doing? I don't get it. What am I supposed to do when you do things that don't make sense? Rather, I want us to spend some time talking about, in light of those verses, what happens when you and I are unwilling to do what Habakkuk does. We need to talk about what happens when you and I are unwilling to be honest with God and even honest with one another, especially the people who walk through life with us and love us. What happens when we're unwilling to be honest? Because sometimes it's very easy to keep it all bottled in, to not talk about it, to be frustrated about it, to try to power through and make it all better. Friends, that's not what God would want us to do. And Habakkuk is a perfect example of something is wrong, something is frustrating, something is disappointing, something you're struggling with, something you just can't get by. You need to go to God about it. If we are unwilling to be honest, here's what happens. It creates a series of problems that in the end, it, it creates this perfect storm where you don't have a chance at spiritual maturity. You can't move to the next level in your relationship with God. You don't have a chance to experience the beauty of the presence of God in authentic worship because something is weighing heavy on your heart. You can't even experience God's grace in difficult moments. You scoff at the people who follow Jesus and somehow in the midst of overwhelming circumstances, they still have joy. You rob yourself of that. So what happens if you and I refuse to be honest with God? These are going to be very matter of fact, but I, I think they're true and I think we need to be honest about this. What happens if we refuse to be honest with God? Well, number one, worship becomes almost impossible. It does. Authentic worship almost becomes impossible. See, when you and I can be honest with God about what's going on in our lives, worship should actually come naturally. We, we get to the point where we say, you know what, this is a horrible circumstance, but that's going to drive me towards God and not away from him. That's Christian maturity. That's when we refuse. That's when we say, you know what, I'm going to be honest with God. I'm going to tell him how I really feel, and then you get to enter into his presence. However, when we refuse to be honest with God, we hold it all in. I'll tell you, and I've seen it, and I see it every Sunday. When we hold it all in and we don't come to God in honesty, worship becomes almost impossible. Or at best, it becomes a ritual that we get through. Why? Because when difficulty and doubt and fear, when all of those things strike at the same time, I want you to know that you have an awesome opportunity to dive into the nature and the character of God. You get to go right to him. We have an opportunity to come face to face with how big God really is and how tiny we really are. Let me put it this way. We get to come face to face with how big God is and how tiny our problem really might be. Worship is that moment. 
However, if we keep it all in, we stay silent, we try to tough it out, and we let nobody in to help us, worship can't happen the way that it needs to happen. I've said at best it becomes a ritual. Listen, when you get punched in the soul, we've had those moments, right? When you, when you get that phone call that you weren't expecting or that relationship fizzles out that you just didn't think was going to happen, but when you get punched in the soul, when you begin to have doubt about yourself or about your relationship with God or doubt about the things around you, when you have frustrations, when, when you have fears, what do you do? Here's what some of you do. You internalize it. You fight it on your own. A, a, a psychology term is that you become a stuffer. You stuff it in. You say, nobody else needs to deal with this. I'm strong enough. I can deal with it on my own. I'm not going to bother anybody with it. You, you internalize it. You stuff it. Now, some of you do the opposite. You don't stuff it. Some of you, what you do is you post it all over the internet, all over social media, hoping to get some other people to rally around you and agree with you so that you can have your misery be enjoyed in some company. Now, some of you, you don't post it on social media, but you'll complain to anybody who will listen to you, whether they asked you to or not, and and you're not looking to get better in the situation. You just hope that they'll take your side. That's what we do. But let me ask you this. Have you ever opened up and been honest with God before doing any of that, before you internalize it or post it for the world to see or find somebody to complain to so they agree with you? Have you ever taken it to God first? See, when that happens, you choose to dive into the presence and the nature of God. You get to run to him in worship, but that can't happen when you refuse to be honest with him. When everything around you is falling apart, do you even consult God in the matter? Habakkuk does. He comes face to face, and you'll see in the weeks to come that God actually answers him and shows him how big he really is. Let me put it this way. Have you ever, in your travels or vacations, have you ever come into contact with something that's just bigger than you? I mean, I believe this is why people love to go to the Grand Canyon. This is why people love to go to the mountains and do crazy things like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro or Mount Everest. This is why people vacation at the beach and in the mountains. You know why? Because I think there's a part of us that's it's just beyond the saltwater taffy and the ice cream and the beach. I think part of us wants, to, uh, wants us to witness what's more powerful than we are. Y- you can't sit at the beach or in the mountains and not be amazed at how big something is. That there's something more powerful than us. There's something larger than us. There's, and, and we get caught up in that moment. I don't know if you've ever had that moment. See, in that moment, when we're in front of something that's just unbelievably large and powerful, we are reminded very quickly of our place in the universe. In that moment, we realize, sometimes it takes longer for others, but in that moment, we realize that we are not all powerful, that we are not all conquering. In that moment, we become aware. We become in awe. This is what worship does for us. In those honest moments with God, we get to realize our place in the universe, and it creates awe. When there's pain or sorrow or hurt or fear, we can run to God. In that moment, there are answers to difficult questions. We can't suppress them. We run into our problems and into our doubts and our fears, and then we get to know the character of God and realize how big and powerful He really is. We get to know his size. We get to know his might. We get to know his strength. And all of those situations, they don't only become bearable, but once in a while, they even become a fountain of joy in our life because of how good God really is. It might sound crazy, but it's true. Listen, if we refuse to be honest with God, the beautiful things that happen in worship, they just become impossible. There's another thing that happens, and it keeps building. What happens if we refuse to be honest with God? Well, number two is that we're forced to pretend. We are forced to pretend. Now, some of you think, oh, no, kids are great at pretending. They've got crazy imaginations. Listen, you and I are better at pretending than we give ourselves credit for. When we refuse to be honest with God and with the people who love us, we are forced to pretend, specifically in the religious arena, we are forced to pretend that everything's okay, and it's really not okay. You know what I love about the vision of our church that we try to drive into everybody's heart? And it's nothing new. It's not a phrase that we came up with. It's just a phrase that we ascribe to that we want to create a place where it's okay to not be okay. 
That's what church should be. But for too long, we refuse to be honest with God and with other people, and we think we can only walk through the doors of the church if everything is okay. That's a lie. Why is it such a bad choice to pretend? Well, I'm glad you asked, because if, if you want to get from point A to point B, you've got to know where point A is, and you've got to know where point B is. Some of you don't even know directions anymore because you use GPS, but the GPS has to know the starting point and the destination. Same with your life. If you don't understand the starting point and the destination, you're not going to go anywhere. We need to know where we are and we need to know where we're going, or more specifically, where God wants us to go. If we can't be honest about where we are with God and with other people, we are simply going to pretend that we're something that we're not. We're going to put off this vibe that everything's better than it's actually going on inside our hearts in the Christian world, we have created this sometimes. And it's easy to get into this routine. If you grew up in church like I did, you, you can kind of figure out the church routine pretty quick. It's like these unwritten rules. I know in baseball, there's unwritten rules. Football, there's unwritten rules. Well, in church, there's unwritten rules. You know what to wear and what not to wear. It's different in every church, but the church that you're in, you, you know. You know what to say and you know what not to say. Nobody has to really tell you. You figure out the routine. You know where, some of you will laugh at this, but you know where you're allowed to sit and where you shouldn't sit. You know when you're allowed to pray out loud and when you should be singing, what to do when the message is over, or when there's a really good point. You understand the routine of church. You, you learn all this when you spend enough time around it. And you can learn that about us here at New City Church. You can learn what we say. You can learn about our culture. You can learn how we do things, the language that we give to things, the things that we say. But here's what happens. If it becomes routine, then you won't understand or practice any of it. And we can't have that happen. When that occurs, you feel like it would be a freeing moment that you know everything, but actually it becomes exhausting. When that happens, when you get into the routine, when you learn how to pretend that everything's okay when it's really not, when that happens, nobody knows who you really are. No one knows who you really are because at that point, you're not confident in God's love for you. You're not confident in the fact that people love you and they want to be gracious to you because if anyone shows you grace, shows you mercy, shows you love, you push it away because they really don't know the real you. Because if they knew the real you, then there's no way that they would want to be gracious to you. So your solution to all of this is, I don't want people to know the real me. I want to act like everybody else, dress like everybody else, sing like everybody. I want to feel like I've got the joy of the Lord, but it's not really there. So until I feel that, I'm just going to continue to pretend. What happens is you get farther and farther away from God, and you get farther and farther away from people. And you're just a shell of yourself who shows up to church, does all the right things, and then you get to go back to your mess when it's over. There's going to be a loneliness that sets in, and it just gets exhausting. See, Habakkuk doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to pretend that everything's okay anymore, and neither should you. So many people struggle in secret for years and years, and they never tell anyone. They never let anyone in to what's really going, in their, going on in their lives because here's why. They just assume that everybody else is okay. They say, I don't want to be the problem. I don't want to be the person that has to ha ask for help all the time. That's why we say all the time that this is a place where it's okay to not be okay because it really is okay to not be okay. These people, they, they never think that anyone could be struggling the same way. And that's just a lie. Somebody, I guarantee you, that's sitting near you or goes to the same church as you, they're struggling in the same way that you are. Maybe they've gotten through it and they've got joy now, but man, they can help you through it. So with these people that just stay in secret, stay silent for so long, they feel alone because the church has become this pretty place full of routine where no one's allowed to struggle and no one's allowed to be honest. Habakkuk says, enough is enough. I'm not going to act like everything's okay. God, I want to know what you're doing. I want to make sense of all of this. What are you doing? Friends, that's what I want for you. Stop pretending. Let people in. Run to God. If everything's not okay, that's okay. You've got to get to point A and say, here's where I'm at and here's where God needs me to go. I need someone to help me get there. If we refuse to be honest with God, then we just are going to keep pretending. And it's exhausting. 
What else happens if we refuse to be honest with God? I think this is the one that weighs on us the most. We forget about the cross. We do. When we refuse to be honest with God and with other people, it creates this forgetfulness about the cross of Jesus Christ. We, we will actually walk away from it because whatever our fear is or whatever our doubt is or whatever our addiction is, whatever the issue is, we will take all of our vitality and our energy and our effort and we will go into that issue to subside it and hide it and avoid it because we want everyone to know that we're okay when reality is we've actually forgotten about the cross. Here's what I want you to know about the cross. The cross is this. It's the objective evidence of God's love and care for you. That's what it is. It's the evidence that God loves you and he cares for you. That's the cross of Jesus Christ. If we refuse to be honest with God, we become issue-driven and not cross-driven. Issue-driven means that you're going to throw yourself at that issue and try to fix it all on your own, wondering if God even loves you. That's the wrong kind of thing. You need to be cross-driven. Because here's the reality. We are going to fail. We are going to stumble. We are going to have these moments where we fall short and we fall back into old patterns. If we don't understand the cross and the mercy that God gave us, we are going to try to muster up more and more strength to overcome that issue. And let me tell you, you can't beat it on your own. You need to be honest with God and with each other. When that happens, when you throw yourself at this thing trying to beat it on your own, you've taken your eyes off the cross. The cross is where Jesus died while you were at your worst. But if your eyes are on the cross, then everything changes. Maybe some of you know the great song of the church. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. It says this in one of the verses. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's what the cross does for us. It brings us back to what's most important. Everything else grows dim. So how does sin and brokenness and pain, and doubt, and fear. How does it lose power in our lives? I'll tell you, it doesn't happen by us disciplining, a, disciplining ourselves so that that thing doesn't exist. It doesn't happen by holding it all in and refusing to be honest with God and others, hoping that it'll just go away, or buckling down saying, I can do this. It doesn't happen that way. Here's how all of those things lose their power in your life. It happens when you marvel at the gift of mercy and grace and forgiveness and love because of the cross. It's as simple as that. That's the only thing that makes the sin and the brokenness and the pain lose its power in your life. It happens when Jesus becomes more lovely and more attractive than your sin, your fear, and your doubt. Habakkuk will tell God everything that he's frustrated about, what he wants to complain about, how he wants to be honest with God, but he will come face to face with how much God loves him. And that becomes more important than what he's facing. That's what I want for you. That's what you should want for you. Because listen, all of the anger of God against our sin, against our shortcomings, it was absorbed completely in the cross when Jesus died for us. So now, if you keep your eyes on the cross, you've got nothing in your life but mercy. You can face those things that seem difficult and overwhelming. But if you refuse to be honest with God, you'd have taken your eyes off the cross. That is what the book of Habakkuk is going to tell us, that it's okay, just like Habakkuk did in those first four verses, it's okay to be honest with God. Tell him how you really feel. He can handle it. Because then you'll be able to worship. Then you don't have to pretend anymore. And you'll get your eyes on the cross and everything else will grow dim. Here's my hope for you in this series. And, and I'm serious about this. My hope for you is that you will grow tired of playing church. I'll say that again. Maybe it's weird for a pastor to say, but I see it. I, am, I, I want you to grow tired and exhausted of just playing church. Playing like everything's okay. I, I hope that as you read Habakkuk and we go through this journey that it exhausts you. Playing church would just exhaust you and all the garbage that you've picked up over the years by not being able to be honest, by having to be perfect all the time, that you would just lose that in our journey through this great Old Testament book. Why? Because, listen, I, I love this about Scripture. I love this about God. And Habakkuk is going to learn this. God actually delights in showing mercy 
to those who do not deserve mercy. Let me say that again. God delights in showing mercy to those who don't deserve it. It's the whole point of the Bible. If you just do a skim through Scripture, would you look at all the people that God calls to himself as major players in this story? There's a bunch of men, and guess what? They have monumental shortcomings. There's a bunch of great women that God chooses to tell his story. They have monumental shortcomings. So for you listening right now, there is no sin in your life with more power than the cross of Jesus. There is no pain, there's no doubt, there's no failure, there's no fear, there's no question that has more power than the love that God has for you, period. So here's my hope. Not only will you grow tired of playing church, my hope is that you will open your heart and mind to hear from the Holy Spirit of God. That you would actually just surrender to Him. Be honest with Him in the middle of whatever you're facing. Let me ask you again, are you exhausted yet? Playing the game like everything's okay when it's really not okay? Why don't you be like Habakkuk and just start being honest with God? Here's a real big challenge. And I know it's a little bit different online than it is in person, but my prayer is that you would actually grab somebody who loves you. Somebody who's been there for you at your worst. It's time to grab them because they love you and because now it's time to let them help you. Let them help you. If at all, at the bare minimum, ask them to pray with you. Ask them to bow down wherever you are saying, I'm tired of, of faking it. I, I need help. Here, here's what's going on. Can you help me? Can you pray with me? Can, can you help me talk to God? Be honest with that person. Be honest with God about what's going on in your life because listen, there is so much freedom in that choice. But at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, there could be so much damage done to your heart and soul if you choose to stay silent. So I want us to allow God to use the book of Habakkuk to ruin us in a good way to make us wholly dependent on him. Let me pray for you as we close our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, would you help us? We thank you for the example of Habakkuk who saw what was going on around him, who felt the frustration, maybe was aware of his shortcomings. Maybe he felt like he couldn't measure up and he let you have it. God, you didn't make sense in what you were doing and Habakkuk was honest with you. May we be like that. Help us. God, we are so prone to trust our own strength. We are so prone to try to do everything on our own. We are so prone to just try to do it in our own might. Would you just help us surrender? Would you help us follow you? Would you help us learn to serve you and to trust you? Show us the freedom that we can experience if we choose to be honest. God, I pray for the person who's got overwhelming problems in their life and they have to act like everything is okay. Would you release them from that today? Yes. For the person that's got fear and doubts and questions, they, they can't get over a failure that they've had. Would you release them from that in the name of Jesus so that they can be honest with you as we take this journey? God, we want to be able to worship. We, we don't want to pretend anymore. And God, we want to keep our eyes on the cross and none of that can happen if we refuse to be honest with you. God, put that person on our minds and on our hearts right now that can help us, that will be there for us no matter what. And as we walk hand in hand, brother to brother, sister to sister, to what you have for us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see you next week as we continue through the story of the Old Testament book, Habakkuk. I, I challenge you to read it. It's only three chapters. There's reading plans that you can be a part of to help you understand. But I'm excited for this journey, and I'm excited for what God's going to do through you as we all try to make sense of what God might be doing around us and in us and through us. May we choose to be honest together. If you want to know more about our church or listen to series like this or to keep catching up on series and, and be ready for when the next message comes out online, you can visit our website at newcitybe.org. There's a way for you to contact us on there, information about our doctrine and what we believe, and you can just get to know us in a better way. And also, I want to let you know we're thankful for our online audience, but there's nothing like joining together in person to worship together, to grab somebody to pray with you. And, and we are open 
for in-person worship services every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We have an adult service. We have a kid service. We have a great group of people that are ready to meet you and walk alongside you as you choose to follow Jesus. We would love to see you for our in-person worship services. Well, that's all for our broadcast today. We want to say have a great day and God bless you. Thank you.